Stockton, California. September 7th, 1963. Eric Wright was born. Just a boy, he hustled to survive the streets. And this boy, he had a dream. They called him Easy e He took America through the streets of Compton for an unforgettable ride. Easy e widely regarded as the king of gangster rap, rose to fame as the controversial founder of NWA and Ruthless Records. A certified gangster and crack dealer, he created a new music style that spawned a billion dollar industry, selling over 50 million albums. This is the personal story of Eric Wright. Yo, this is me on New Generations, and uh, come follow me now. Easy E. MC ran with a bite like 1010. That's right, the motherfucking doc. Yellow boy. B.O. motherfucking C in the house. Fuck you know this. <laughs> you gotta carry it easy, you get fucked up on the street. So you gotta be and prepared. This got infrared scope on it. You put the dot on your target, then you blow this shit out the motherfucker. I'm joking. And we figure it like this. We make our records based on stuff that's happening where we live, you know. And people out there that don't like it, fuck them. These guys largely came out of, not all of them, but largely came out, I mean, as the album name, you know, straight out of Compton. I mean, these were guys from, from pretty tough neighborhoods and pretty tough part of L.A. In some sense, normal life uh, ceased to exist. Uh, the economy was so bad that nobody had work. And on top of the bad economy came this new form of, of, of cocaine, crack. There was a lot of drugs in, uh, in the 60s, early 60s, and late 70s, especially is when the when the Compton Dope Exchange kind of took over. If you're a young kid, uh, there, you couldn't, there weren't jobs. I mean, the programs that provided jobs for young kids were wiped out, and they're stuck there. And then you have this this wave of crack coming through the community. So it's pretty pretty uh, horrible circumstances. After high school, is when it really picked up. You know, different gangs, this neighborhood is one color, this, you know. Things started to change dramatically. Do you know what triggered that change? Dope. Today, there's a new epidemic. Smokable cocaine, otherwise known as crack. It is an explosively destructive and often lethal substance which is crushing its users. It is an uncontrolled fire. These new gangs, they had no, no boundaries. Uh, they, I mean, they, they just murdered for the, just the thrill of murdering. They, they killed just to say that they killed somebody. Dre New Easy from the same neighborhood. Cube stayed by Dre's auntie, right, actually right next door. I kind of got into the drug thing, you know, just was this guy named Horace, big dude, and was Easy's cousin. Now, I knew Easy as Easy just as a little Eric. He just come around because that was his cousin. And Eric would do most of the deliveries and stuff. His cousin got hit, he got killed, and there was some how we say some pharmaceuticals hidden. And that's how Ruthless really got started because he the only one who knew where it was at. Easy made his money um, by being a street pharmacist at this point. By being a street pharmacist, you know how to deal with everybody. You get that lingo, that mentality, 
And by the weight that you're carrying with the amount of product you got comes a respect. You know, he was a guy in the neighborhood you didn't mess with. He was well respected. He was uh, uh, well liked by a lot of people. Uh, certain times, you, you, certain people have a persona, or a, we 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 call it like a, a light around him that that seems to draw people to him. And he was that kind of a guy that just seemed to uh, to draw people to him. It, you know, a guy that you could tell was going to be somebody. You know, he he kicked he kicked a little knowledge and KRS one, he kicks a lot of knowledge and public enemy. You know, them kind of groups, you know, they draw attention. You know what I'm saying? They they go against the grain. And that's the type of groups I like. You know, they go against the grain. Realistic radio shack shit that don't match, you know what I'm saying? I had it back then, so we would we would play the old records. LA then was a big dance scene. This locking and popping, soul train kind of dancing. The thing in LA back then in the early 80s was you were a DJ, but you also made records. And then the, a new form of music that, that emerged in, in New York in the early, late 70s, early 80s, and that migrated kind of fitfully across the country to LA. Back then, there was no hardcore rap back then. It was all more up-tempo on the West Coast dance music. So we were all doing this kind of electro, what we called electro. What's electro now is not what we called electro back then. We called electro funk. Evie and Dre had a DJ crew called a high power crew. And Dre used to do parties and easy, like, assume pay for the equipment. It all started at Eve After Dark on Avalon No Segundo upstairs. Back then, from the time we started to the time we end, end, you know, ended, it was packed. There was sweat on the floor, there was sweat on the walls. People were partying all night long. I mean, nonstop dancing, nonstop partying. It was just just crazy vibe going on. Uh, another buddy of mine named Tim brought Dre to my attention because Dre lived with his grandma, uh, not, not far from the club, about this kid who was, you know, doing all these fantastic mixes, and I need to check him out. So I had the hottest jocks in the city, you know, Yella and the Unknown and myself. And he was, you know, he was doing some different kind of things. So Tim brought him up. There was really wasn't no West Coast rapping into the Wrecking Crew. There was no other groups. And that kind of like influenced us. At the club, we used to DJ. We had them down for little concerts. And we just seen how simple it was. A person rapping over a record. So that was our goal right there. Once we seen Run DMC come down, that was the start of us doing music then. Run DMC at the LA Sports Arena and they had lasers and shit, and that just blew my mind. That was when I really realized that this could really be big, this could be rock and roll. Because prior to that, rap was just in clubs, rap was in basements and garages and rec centers. It wasn't in arenas. And when I saw that, I'm like, yo, yo, this is you. One of the things that, that emerged at the swap meet in South LA County, the Rhodium Swap Meet, was a music stall run by a guy who was a grad student at Cal State in psychology. This guy's name was Steve Yano. His spot was a place to go back then for the mixtapes and for, you know, whatever hot record was out right then, he had it at back then. So you go to the Rhodium, go straight to Steve's spot, pick up your stuff. So he knew everybody because all the DJs would come through there. Oh, he was the business. Steve was the business. I just heard on the street, Dre's releasing these dope ass, you know, underground mixtapes. And I was like, really? He goes, yeah, uh, he's releasing through a guy named Steve. And I was like, Steve, where at? And he goes, Steve, at the Rhodium. Mixtapes started back in the day when uh, when um, these guys, Dre, Yella, um, or with Lonzo Williams, they they were the Wrecking Crew at that time, and they did the traffic jams. And um, Lonzo had a group called the Wrecking Crew, of which uh, Dre, Yella, Clientel, Lonzo himself were all a member of. And I'd go by there. To, I asked him, hey, if I bring you some records, could you do that? Could you, you know, kind of hook it up the way you're hooking this stuff up? They said, sure, bring it, bring, bring your records, and 
you know, we'll, um, we'll, we'll mix you up a tape. But we was doing mixtape for the swap meets. We was doing hood shit on the mixtape because we knew that was only sell in the hood. Easy uh, at the swap meet, he would come by and uh, Easy was kind of a quiet guy. He would very modestly come up to the stand, look uh, through all the records just like any of the other customers I had. Dre's name would always come up and uh, he knew Dre, he went to high school with them and they were, they were kind of, they were buds. And he would say, oh, you know, that's my homeboy's tape, and he does the scratching, and he does this and that. He said, tell him Eric came by, and I said, oh, okay, sure. Easy uh, had been gone for a while, came back to the neighborhood and was looking for Dre, and, and every week he'd come back to the swap meet and, and say, you know, you, have, you know, hook me up with Dre, hook me up with Dre, give me his numbers. Finally, one night Yana gets a call at home at 2.30 in the morning, and it's Easy and Dre. These guys get on the horn, and... Two in the morning, I get a call, and we're on a three-way. Eric want to open up a record store. Ray, uh, Dre's wants to start a record label. The easy was in Dre's ear, telling him how he gonna get him paid, blah, 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 blah. Dre and them are looking at the money that Run DMC are making. You know, LL Cool J, y'all ain't worth a pair of pants and a pair of tennis shoes. That's it, he'll wear no shirt, okay? And we got to go, you know, iron stuff, and wear sequence clothes, and got Jerry Curl juice, and. Activator. We didn't make any money from that group, so so we just thinking of another way to make some money, and along came this group. The fight became um, when they wanted us to change our groove up, and I was I was open to suggestions, but I just couldn't do the radical change, go from being a temptation to uh, Tupac. You know that was too much of a drastic change for me. The beginning, N.W.A. It was more the ending of the Wrecking Crew. So that's when Dre came to me and said, hey, we started this group, leave the wrecking crew. So, you know, we just left. We just left. Then Lonzo was out. Then that's when Easy, Easy turned the tables and we got another route to go with Eric. We just decided to do it. It worked, you know, and niggas are genius. You know, they just put uh, two and two together and there you go. You got Ruthless Records. style that we had, the hardcore gangster rap. At first, Easy was into it because he wanted the money. You know, because Easy was all, he, Easy liked toys, he wanted stuff. But then he liked the music, you know, he really got into the music and I think he got into the fame. He liked the attention. The attention was like, you know, a thing. He had Dre and them, you know, they, he had Dre all over, all over the place, you know, doing and making money, okay? Dre went from getting whatever he could from me whenever I had it to a hundred grand a year as a new producer. Me and Dre did all the producing. You know, all the producing. The writing was Ren. Q wrote the words for Easy's Boys in the Hood. And then Easy would just show up, do the work. He didn't do no writing, nothing. You know, show up, take six hours on one line, you know, do the words. But it was his sound of his voice. That's what the key to the group was his sound. Dre couldn't play an instrument of any kind, but he had a great ear. And he, was, he, he knew the history of, of rock and roll and R&B really well. He listened to jazz. He listened to his mom's record collection since he was a little kid. He always had the gift for music, even back then. I mean, it's something, it's kind of hard to explain what it was, but it was something he can hear. It's like he can hear further than what the record was. The record stops here, he can hear further. Ice Cube was the, the intellectual center of the group. He was the, the lyricist, the guy who, who was much more aware of the world around him than the other guys. And, he's, and you know, look about this. There's a kid from the Crenshaw District who gets on a bus every morning at 7 o'clock and gets sent to the valley to go to high school, Taft High in the Valley, which was like going to another planet. Um, and he says riding that bus just filled with anger every day. You just look out the windows and see what people had out there that he didn't have and that none of the people he knew had. Um, and you know, when you're 17 years old, you tend to be pretty pissed off anyhow. He, he, what he saw this is, you know, was rank injustice, and it, and it angered him. So clearly, that informed 
the lyrics. Uh, and the first record they were going to produce was by a, a, a duo from the East Coast who came out and Dre had a song for them. They didn't like the song, so they walked. And so Easy and Dre are sitting there with an empty studio that, that uh, Easy has to pay for. And so Dre says, well, why don't you do the song to Easy? And Easy says, I can't rap, man. Come on, what are you talking about? And, and Dre says, no, come on, try it. You're paying for it anyhow. You might as well try it. And so he does it, and it's Boys in the Hood. He would have to do so many takes, like a million takes. We're like, come on, Eric, just get it. He's like, I'm trying, I'm trying. There was this uh, a record pressing plant up in Santa Monica Boulevard called Cola Records, and it's it was it was an interesting place because you could you could go in there for 500 bucks, the guy'd make you a thousand records. Because you could walk into Macola with your tapes in your hand and your label copy on a sheet of paper and have a record by Friday. Ray had has a genius mind to make bring out the, the, the smallest amount of talent in anybody. So if you have that in the bomb production, he was able to create an easy E with that de little de demonic voice that he had. You know, he had like a really street demonic voice, so he made that voice over these eerie gangster tracks, which, you know, which the conversation, the combo on it was ill, so it, it took over the gang. So it, it was kind of like that was his creation. But, but it was Easy's money and business savvy. You know what I mean? So you need the both of them. One without the other is not happening. Easy had everything. And he just put his own money into it, went to McCola, pressed them up, and he, Easy was so cold, he'd say, go get, some go get some money and go buy some records and sell them yourself. Boys in the Hood had just dropped. You know, during the time I started going, and it was doing really good, but they were still selling them out of the trunk of their car. That they brought their records to was the swap meet. You know, they walk up to the stand, yo, Steve, you know, I got this new record, I put this record on, I play this thing over the course of a weekend, I could tell you if that thing was gonna be a hit. And I remember when I first heard what motherfucker, you know, on, on, on the record, I was like, holy shit, did he just say that? I mean, it was just so, that's one thing that a lot of people don't understand, that when they brought that into rap songs, at least in my, and, you know, in my book, that had never been done before. It was just so street, it was just so hardcore that uh, when I would hear them cuss, I would just kind of like look around like, man, is he, are they gonna allow that? You know, that shit is crazy right there, you know what he's saying. When they came out, it was it was, it was was kind of like a double-edged sword. You know, it was a lot of positive and negative came out of it at the same time because the positive side is that, you know, shit, they put us on the map, you feel me? It's like, they know a motherfucker from Compton in China right now. You know, talking about the hood, let people know how we felt about it, you know, how we was just really uh, looking for a release, man, looking for an outlet to, to release some of the shit that was pent up in, inside of us. And, and rapping let us do that, you know, so that shit was pure, man, because I'm telling you, we didn't know it was going to sell. We just thought people in the hood would like the record. It was straight from the heart. That's why it did what it did. This guy with a hat and a jerry curl and just like dressed real, real hood. I said like, damn, like what's he doing here? You know what I mean? Like who is that? Cause he just looked like he was somebody. Like, you know how you see people sometimes like that dude is, that dude looked like he's somebody, right? So I was DJing and then he pulled on my shirt. And he's like, hey man, I got this record, man. You should check this out. So I go, all right, man, well, cool. Give me a minute though. Cause I'm live on the air right now and, and I'll check it out. So he waited, tugged on my shirt again. He's like, man, you need to really check this out, man. And then he says, Dr. Dre did it. And that's what kind of caught my ear when he said Dr. Dre, because I already had known Dr. Dre from Wrecking Crew days and things like that. You know what I mean? I've seen him around. I kind of knew him. So I was like, oh, Dr. Dre, OK, I'll check it out. So then I played it. I listened to it in the headphone. And, 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 and I was like, wow, it sounded like 6 in the morning to me. And he says, nah, man, that ain't no 6 in the morning, man. That's Boys in the Hood. So I played one verse of it. And I got out of it fast because nobody ever heard the record. You know what I mean? Like, it was brand new. At the end of the day, turntables would be out. I'd be dropping the pegboards down, pulling the records off. I flipped the pegboard over to the shiny side. OK. Button them up next to each other. DJ scratches. And here these kids out come out, and they start break dancing. Unbelievable. Would have never believed this would have happened. Steve at the Rodeo. He would call us, yeah, I'm, I'm out of tapes. Can y'all do another one next week? 
We'd be like, all right, we just wrap some hood shit and send it to them and they fly. I'm a firm believer that if it wasn't for them building up a lot of street credibility, getting the respect of the streets before you know the albums came out, if they would have never done those mixtapes, I don't think they would have been as huge as they are you know, today. side for Ruthless was right at the beginning, right at the Boys in the Hood, it was a Ruthless record. But it wasn't really a business. He was just selling out his car and stuff like that. The business side came, you know, he wasn't he was just a rapper, he wasn't a writer, no music, nothing. He won't be in the studio like me and Dre for twelve hours. He did all the business side. Ruthless was at first just a title. You know what I mean? But he owned it. See one thing when he's business. He had it on paper. Ruthless records, it was his. Without any evident, you know, no training whatsoever, really, uh, was apparently, according to people who, who knew him then, was a natural businessman. I don't give a damn how much talent you did had, had at the time. You couldn't have done it without Jerry. All these guys made this money and these careers based on his initial efforts. None of these other bitches could have did it without him. Heller started hanging out there and meeting these kids uh, who were coming there doing this, looking for talent. He was always looking for talent. Easy knew about Heller. Heller knew nothing about Easy, but Lonzo were friends. And Easy started bugging Lonzo for an introduction to Heller. Lonzo kept telling me about this guy that wanted to meet me, this uh, supposed drug dealer from Compton who wanted to meet me named Eric Wright. Alonzo agreed to make the introduction if Easy would pay him for it. I finally agreed to meet Easy because Alonzo told me that Easy that uh, Easy had paid him seven hundred and fifty dollars for the introduction and he needed the money. I introduced him to him, picked up a few bucks, in doing the introduction, and stepped off. And Heller tells the story that uh, he paid him in the lobby of McCoy Records, reached down in the sock and pulled out seven hundred and fifty bucks and gave it to Alonzo and said, "Get out of here." I said to him, "You got anything for me to hear?" And he just looked and said, "Yeah." So. Like, that's what our relationship is about. You need to let the music do the talking. It wasn't, I got this guy, and this is my boy. The two of them hit it off, Heller and, and Easy. Um, I guess they're, maybe operators recognize one another. I'm not sure. I think that's kind of what they both were in some respects. They're both talented guys, smart guys. He played me Boys in the Hood and a couple of other songs, and we made our deal right there on the spot. Now it's the time for the company to fight for. We actually tried for Island Records. They had the first opportunity. I had never heard anything like that before in my life. I mean, it was just a window into a world that I, it was just completely foreign to me. And it was exciting, it was dramatic, it was electrifying. Easy and um, Dre came up to my office and they both walked in and Easy was just, you know, this little guy, but he was like 10 feet tall. He was so confident. I had a radio show called Life is Hard. And what Life is Hard was, was uh, the format was anything hard. It was everything from Slayer to Public Enemy's first record uh, to uh, Ministry. All this, I mean, it was just, the, the only criteria was that it just had to be really hard and brutal music. So I sent it to him and he just, same reaction as me completely floored by the song. I can remember playing it that first time. I had just got the tape in the mail that afternoon, so I didn't have a time, I had the chance to, uh, to uh, uh, clean it up. The song hadn't been on the air probably 30 seconds, and all eight lines on the telephone lit up with these people calling for Who the fuck is that? He started getting a lot of phone calls and uh, people complaining. So the next thing you know, it's a... Uh, I'm not sure if the FCC got involved or what, but he did get fired. And um, and then it became a big press story in Dallas, which is where the station was and where Jeff lived at the time. And um, so I told Dre and Easy about Jeff. Poor Jeff got fired. He played it, but it was the first airplay they'd gotten outside of L.A. By that time, Jerry Heller had come into the uh, picture, it wasn't just Maury, and so Jerry was really more involved in the negotiation, and it pretty much in the end came down to him saying, make it 300 and you got the deal. If not, then I got a cousin over at Priority, and uh, I can take Michelle A and JJ Fad to Atlantic, and 
and um, and our lawyer called his bluff and said no, 250, take it or leave it. So I wound up making a deal with a guy named Jerry Greenberg. Uh, first I made a deal with Brian Turner at Priority who distributed through Capital and then I made a deal with Jerry Greenberg and we were on our way. Priority came along and said Easy can use his label, name, everything on the record. No, Easy is definitely the godfather. I know it's a few people out there that's, that had their things going like Ice-T and Schoolie D, but ain't nobody harnessed it like uh, Easy. You know? he, he harnessed that shit and made it blow. He was just somebody other than the rapper Easy e He was a human person, and it taught me how to learn how to treat people when you're in this business. And it's just like, you know, he always told me, be about your business, get your money right, do that. But you gotta learn how to treat people in this business. And I think that's something that I learned, and that's something that a lot of artists and CEOs, they don't really capture that. They too caught up. Easy was large because here's this little black inky ass nigga to come along and say what the hell he say and no mechanicals, points, breakdowns, the intelligence of this person being from Compton, he's dangerous. You know, he, he's real savvy when it comes to business, so he's, he, you know, he looks at things as, he looks at the future as opposed to what's happening now. You know, he already has his plans from what I'm seeing. I, you know, it's like he makes the right decisions, you know, more so than a lot of cats in the game. But he was ruthless. He was the entity itself, the, the vision behind it, the drive. There were a lot of other elements as far as talent, but the direction, the business mind and everything, it was Eric. He knew from the beginning how to, how to, how to do business. And you wouldn't ever guess that something like this would fit into the, the music world, which is one of the most sort of closed off business groups in the country. And he was the whole person behind the concept because what it was was easy would tell us stories about, you know, Dre, Death Row, all these things, and that's how he came up with the lyric. If he was white, a lawyer, in, the, in our business world today, be on Forbes. And these people have been doing the same thing forever. And easy in five minutes was, was part of it. Went one day and he had bought DJ equipment and all this stuff. And I'm out here just doing what I gotta do, you know. And uh, I remember it was like back in the day, county people got the whole bunch and said, I'm out. You do it. I wanna do it. I said, what you gonna do? He said, I'm gonna rap. Rap? Okay. I'm gonna rap on down the street with mine, you know, I left. Eric was like, you know, businessman, he's seen opportunity. Dre's coming with a deal of music. And he saw a way out of the dope life. We did the album. Didn't take that long, about a month to do. Straight out of Compton. There wasn't a lot of sampling in it. You know, if we wanted something in the track, we'd go get a guitar player to play it. You know what I mean? Or a bass player to play it. Or if we wanted a flute, we get a flute player to play it because that's what made it sound better. I think that our record was so scary back then because the conservatives, the politicians, the middle America had never heard about Compton or heard about any cities like that. And these white kids in the suburbs would hear that and it scared the shit out of them at first, but then they're like, whoa, man, that's amazing. You know, and they went from, you know, listening to whatever crap they were listening to to listening to NWA. You drive down the street and you hear these white kids listening to NWA full blast in their car and shit. The rich kids want to know how they do it in the ghetto. And that's why you might see it, that's why you sell so many records in the suburbs, but you need that yellow stamp. It was something that they had never heard before. And the music had such a broad influence. It had the hip hop in there. It had the electro in there and it had the rock in there. Cause we had a lot of guitars in a lot of our songs. And you know, even the kids who didn't like rap could identify with the power of the music. This exploded into the, into the wider culture. The suburbs, white suburbs is where NWA was the most popular. One day I remember I was driving on Compton Boulevard coming for work, got on my little uniform, and I saw a SWAT truck. I'm like, man, I'm nosy. You know, I want to know. I go in the alley, 
I see his girlfriend. She's just standing there. There's one of his baby's mama. She's standing in the alley. I'm like, Joey, what happened? She said, they're shooting a the video. I said, who? She said, Eric. He I looked down at the thing, and he's standing in the middle of the thing. Remember those old big brick banana phones? He's standing there holding the phone. And, I, and, you know, and she said, Eric, look. And he looked at me, and I walked up to him. The first thing I could say was, I was wrong, bro. You did it. He said, see, I told you. He said, what you doing now? I said, man, working well. And he said, you don't want to do that no more. I quit the next day. And me and him, from then on, we was rolling. I would say 1989 the tour. Everybody loved the tour. Not just the fans. I mean everybody. The crew member, the light members, everybody. We knew girls that would do very, I would say, freaky things for past. The vibe was was incredible, man. I mean, I, I would be backstage, okay, when everybody's getting ready. And to them getting ready is throwing on their loads, fixing their Raiders hats, drinking eight ball, getting really fucked up, you know? Okay, it's time. You know, let's go. You know, uh, Yellow would run up there, play the intro beat, you know? Then guys would come out. I remember Ray, Ren, and Dre would come out first, you know, and then uh, Q would come out, and then Easy would come out last. From the minute they walked on stage, it was just slamming, you know? I mean, everything it was just tied to shit. You know, but that first time they rolled through, they were still kind of getting... They would pull people up on stage. I remember guys putting up their Compton jackets, you know, showing it off. But the crowd was just, like, so crazy. I can actually say there's very... I could probably count on one hand performers that I've seen that 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 I can say, you know what, there'll never be another show like this again. Compton's in the house. Hey, yo, check this out. Check this out. Check this out. What's up? How many of y'all ladies like seeing my man dance? All right, then. I don't think a record can influence somebody into doing a crime. If that type of mentality was there, they was going to do the crime anyway, regardless of the record or not. What I say, they play a lot of rock and roll. You know what I'm saying? With the satanic stuff and the Madonna, she can get on there half naked. But when they, when they see something real from, like, the black community or whatever, what's going down with the situation about the police, you know, they, they want to band it. The world reacted to NWA, NWA the way it always reacts to something like this in horror. Um, and, and as I said before, you could have a movie with the same content and nobody would think twice about it. But all of a sudden, you've got this new form of music that is terrifying to parents, uh, terrifying apparently to some police officers, uh, terrifying in a way that if they'd taken five seconds to listen to it, they'd know not to be terrified by it. And we figure it like this. We make our records based on stuff that's happening where we live, you know. If I took myself and placed myself into their hood, into their lifestyle, where they grew up, into their surroundings, all they were doing was talking about their life. Like NWA was talking about fuck the police for a reason because we were in Compton, you know, getting assaulted by police even at, you know, the young age of 10, 11, and 12. And, you know, they talked about, you know, just all the violence. You know what I'm saying? You know, the NWA is like, before NWA was just hip hop, after NWA was gangsta rap, there was a new genre of music. You live in Compton or you live in the hood, you could be driving down the street minding your business and you get pulled over for nothing. You sat on the curb for nothing, sweated, your whole car searching, like, I woke up, I left the house, went to the swap meet, and I got pulled over and sweated for an hour for no reason. Or my boy got jacked and beat up by the police. Or he got, you know, we were just pretty much telling stories. And then there was the crackheads in the neighborhood and the drug dealers and the drug heads. So everything that we saw, we just started, hey man, let's write about that. Let's talk about that. That's cool. We were shooting a video, and Easy was hanging out the top of a 6 foot. 6'4 and Pala. And uh, since he was hanging out the top, the police knew we was doing the video. They still gave him a ticket. 
Rap star Eazy-E will be able to film portions of a new music video in Compton after all. But during a heated city council meeting last night, the mayor dressed down Eazy-E for ruining the city's image. Our Matt Stevens has more. Eric Wright, known in the rap world as Easy e an artist whose lyrics are arguably the raunchiest, most vulgar, most degrading assemblings of words ever allowed to be recorded. Today, made nice with Compton Mayor Omar Bradley. And we believe now that we have come up with an agreement that would allow these gentlemen to shoot their video without depicting women as uh, whores, uh, without depicting African-American men as animals. Bradley did not like the script he read for a music video Easy e wanted to shoot in Compton. So the two sides met for nine hours and ironed out a deal. Easy e will still remain Easy e but we're not going to portray Compton as a bad city because Compton is a good city. Charles Davis, Compton's city clerk for 20 years, hopes that's true. You know, you get tired of that stuff, and then all of a sudden somebody wants to come forward and make a rap and, and a song and, and the, the tagging sheet that we had that they presented to us. We could do it because we was around it all. Right. Like you we can't do everything. I mean, killings, robbery, murder, uh, thieving, and everything. The whole nine yards, dope dealing, everything. Everything you hear on our records is true. Yeah, we figure you can't, you can't rap about nothing you don't know nothing about. People speaking, it was the minorities speaking their minds, and it hadn't, that hadn't been done, that hadn't been done, on anything recorded since Huey P. Newton. You know what I'm saying? Was speaking, and you know, Gil Scott Heron, they, like they never heard that aggressive tone, and you know, Ice Cube and Easy and Dre and all of them. That's what they brought to the table, man. So you need the ghetto, and what goes on in the ghetto, for us, that's case of rap. For us, if it's low riders, for us, a guy having no money, for if it's a fight. Fours that got called a woman a bitch. Fours, you know, a woman wearing her skirts up to here. That's what you see in the ghetto. So when you get a guy really from the ghetto, he's really in tune. He's really in tune with goes on on the block. A real controversial song coming out called Fuck the Police. That's going to start It'll be shit. out in January. What is that talking about? Well, Self-explanatory. Fuck, Fuck the police. Fuck the police. For no reason at all, because you black, you got a little bit of money. And, and we getting back at beepers, them. Uh, all, all police ain't bad police, just like 90% of them. The best thing that ever happened to NWA was one day Priority Records gets a letter from a direct, uh, assistant director of the FBI. Uh, his name was Aldridge. In which he, he sings out the song, Fuck the Police. It and doesn't say he's going to do anything about it because there's really nothing he can do about it, but saying how unappreciated it is um, by police officers everywhere. And it creates this huge controversy about a record nobody had ever heard. I think that helped sell the record because that put it on television. You come into a city, you get off the plane, and the police are waiting for you in that city. When you get off the plane because the police or the, you know, the city council, whoever from the city before called and said we were coming, and this is what we did in their city. At the end of the tour, we're going to start getting funny. Okay, I guess easy now, because at first we had no contracts. So I guess they wanted contracts before we got to the end of the tour. We was halfway and Cube wouldn't sign his contract. Cube was, he was almost alienating himself from everybody, pretty much. It was, like I said, we, we was, all I remember is just doing shows and okay, here's here's this you know record we gotta do. We're in the studio, we go do shows, we're in the studio, we finish up the record, record gets put out, you know, and that's right after the record got put out, that's about when I left. I don't even think we ever had any beef at all the only time that there was started to be beef was around the Jerry Heller stuff and even then you know I just bounced it wasn't like I was you know whatever I just bounced I was like man I can't do this I'm out Cube will come in do words and leave he doesn't hang out doesn't this and that he does his thing and he walks out went in there with that bat and started beating up that office yeah you know after he did that you know what happened Brian said what's the problem I ain't get my motherfucking money. Oh, so 
you, you, is this what about his money? He go a check. He go your own label. And he go your budget. Go do your album. Problem song? Problem song. Lunch my record. Because after the tour, I didn't see Cube anymore. No more after the tour. Right, right after we got off to that bus for the last time, that was the end of him. I'm more than happy on, on what's been going on. I'm more than happy with the move, more than happy to really get my career going like I wanted to go. You know what I'm saying? You said a million copies later. Here we are. It's only five weeks into the album. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, I can't do nothing but be happy, you know? Cube, you know, I think it was inevitable that he would leave. He was a junior guy. Even though he was the lyricist, he was the kid. Uh, and of course he was going to get screwed. I don't think there was any beef until the beef with, you know, Cube and NWA after Cube left and then with Dre and Easy. So that's when the beef actually started. And to me, it was just a lack of communication and pe too many people getting involved instead of two men sitting down talking. And hey, man, you know, you owe me this money. I want this side. I'm the creative side and, and you need me a lot more than you think you do. It's about money. Okay, Dre felt he should have been at an at a, uh, equal share of Rufus. And Easy knows if he give him an equal share, the scales are gonna shift considerably here. Well, you know, I had to do my thing, man. Try to make another people money. It's time to make Dre some ends. He heard about Dr. Dre. I don't think he was hurt about the business. I think he was more hurt personal. Like, I seen it in his face. Like, he's like, man, that's fucked up, man. I done done a lot of shit for that dude, man. Like. I remember when his, his, he was sleeping on couches and shit, and I would put money in his pocket, man, and try to help him and his kids out and all kind of shit. Like, I would look out for him, and then he met this bodyguard dude, and six months later, like, he's your homeboy. But he'll see he'll see one day, he's going to find out who that dude is. But when Dre left, he, it, he was just, he was like, devastated. You know what I mean? And what the surprising thing was a yellow stage. When Dre called me, saying he's leaving. He didn't say nothing specific. He just said, I'm leaving. You want to come? Yes or no. And that was it. And I told him, I'll call you back. And I haven't called you back yet. But easy one day, we're in his 850, and, and, uh, <clears throat> and Dre Day came on the radio. And you know, I was sitting in the car, and I was looking out the window this way, and I had the fucking comes on. He's like, Mr. Buster, where the fuck you at? Can't scrap a lick. <laughs> I was just like, damn, man. Like, yeah, I'm in the car with E. You know, like, imagine being in the car with Easy e when a record is on the radio and it's dissing him. So imagine, like, that's like an odd moment. Even though he's my homeboy and all, it was a real weird moment. Like, wow, dude, this is crazy. So little by little, like we started going like this, and by the time I got to over here, I'm just laughing, and, and he's looking at me, and he's just laughing. He's really laughing, like we're both like busting up at the red light, and he's like laughing. He's like, "Oh man, fuck that nigga, man." Remember that shit? Got teeth in your mouth, so my dicks got to fit. Yeah, that's that gangster shit, man. Dre said that a long time ago, man. I was going up in Compton, man. I was like one. Of, I thought I was the number one NWA fan in the world. Still am, man. That's why I got shit tatted on my chest, man. To come meet up at the studio, he went by himself. He wasn't scared of the people, cause he knew him. And he went there, and some homies from the West Side. We got your mama, and we got Jerry. Sign this, homie. Huh? You don't sign it. It's over. He scribbled. He called Jerry. Jerry. Hey, Eric, what's going on? You all right? He said, yeah, hold on. He called. Hey, Ma. Hey, baby, how you doing? You all right? Yeah, where you at? Come at home. <laughs> That's when he put out a fax. A blast. Every record label, every distributor, every radio station, everything. He was hurt, and any man would. You know what I mean? You, It's like baking a cake. You need the eggs, you need the milk. Well, NWA was the cake because they benefited him just as well as he benefited them. Dre's production, it complimented him. Cube's lyrics, it complimented him. So, I mean, when you have that whole chemistry and it just it's not working no more and everybody go their separate ways, they still being pro prosperous, and it's like, okay, well, what do I do? I started this, so you just gotta kinda think of how he really would feel, but I know that he was hurt. 
and uh, I said, what's going on here? And Easy said, you know this guy Shook Knight? I said, yeah. He says, well, I'm going to kill him. He said, this guy's going to be a problem, and I think I should kill him. I said, let me think wow. this. I said, let me think this thing through. I said, first of all, we're doing ten million dollars a month with six employees. I said, we're the most successful startup record company in the history of, of the, the music business. And you want to kill this guy? I said that just doesn't make any sense to me. That he was going to do, go do it. I took him seriously. I talked sense to him because he did listen to me, and I was always very logical. Back to the days when Dre gone, actually Ren was gone too, and it was just me and E. I mean, we it struggled a little bit. Still did like little groups and stuff like that. Still had deal, but that's when it all so like was all falling apart. Um, the fact that it went on for as long as it did after that was pretty amazing if you think about it, uh, because those are two huge, hugely talented guys to have, to have gone missing. Dre left. But he was still under contract, so Easy was getting paid off of that money for a long time. He had negotiation power to negotiate a percentage of everything that Death Row and Interscope did. See, people didn't know that Sony was paying Eric money for the chronic. Because they put it out, and Dr. Dre was still signed to Easy. So they settled. You know, he was eating. No trust, no motherfuckers. Because everybody in the music industry is out to get you. You know what I'm saying? The music industry is the most doggy dog, doggy dog business you can get into. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you gotta be in on all your own shit. You know, all your meetings. You know exactly where the money's coming from, who's paying the money, you know, how much money is, is getting issued out, and make sure you sign all your own checks. I mean, like that song when he said, you know, you can diss me all you want, but the same records you making is paying me, buddy, so go ahead, have a ball. And the boy don't know that he got a third of the crime. He got a third of Dog Pound. He got a third of Snoop. It was a third of everything Dre touched. So keep touching, buddy. Go ahead. You know? Eric didn't care. Eric made more money over Dre than the Chronic album. Come on now. <laughs> now that's gangsta. Easy was definitely a loyal. He that was him. Ruthless was his baby. That was his thing. He was in it 110% all the time. I mean, all the time. But, you know, he just stayed with it and, and held up, you know, like playing football. You get tackled, but you hold on to the ball, so. Yeah, we started doing a show, and basically I wrote it on a piece of paper. You know what I mean? I said, look, dog, we're going to do this, do this, do this. At this time, we're going to do this. And, and we just got on the air. And he was trying to really do this radio thing because he, later on, I found out, was going to buy a station out in Phoenix. You know, and he wanted to call it KEZE and he was gonna have us move out there. So he was a very smart guy. He, he wanted to go in to the beat to basically sniff out how they do it and get to know each department and like, and hear like their game. And he, he sat there talking about Billy, he said, man, look at all these groups. He had must had 10, 15 groups on the list that I never heard of. See, his thing is he had a good heart. A group come to him, he put him in the studio. Another group come and put him in the studio. He was spending a lot of money. And he showed me a paper, he was like a million, 1.7 million or something. Just invested in the group that's not even out. He, he would go, he would do things like he would put out a ton of artists and throw them up, throw them up in the air and something's got to hit out of artists, you know, out of 20 artists, something, something's got to hit. Bone came. Remember, Bone Thugs came. That brought everything. It was a kind of low, but when Bone got there and, they, and when we heard that sound, you know, he, he knew. When we used to do the Ruthless Radio Show, he used to play Thuggish Ruggish Bone every week. And, and, and we didn't get the record. We didn't get it. Like, oh man, he's gonna play that song again? Oh man, dude. And he was like, nah, man, there's something about them. The sound, dude, no one's doing this. Whatever. Come on, Brian, bro. Still got something to say. Uh oh, let's get it off the tank. Get him up, big. Get, get him up, baby. Uh -oh. Oh. Go ahead, get him off. <laughs> 
Get your rib shot. <laughs> Hey man, you gotta stop playing, man. I'm just be wanting to fuck you up, man. Yo, Brian, what you know what's up? Oh, he hired that nigga. He was hard, he hard, he been listening to your CD, <laughs> man. Be a funky motherfucker, Lee. Hey, you don't follow me around like that, man. I be getting nervous as fuck. Oh, he's gonna bust some little shit for y'all. It was me, him, and my daughter, and we we're in his Jeep Cherokee, and and we're driving in El Monte, and the record comes on Power 106. It's now took off the record. And by the way, Easy used to call me every week to tell me the sound scan to fuck with me. Like, hey, we just done 250,000. And then he called me, we got, yeah, no, I'm at 375. And we got to that, yeah, no, I just cracked 500,000. And I just laugh, like, damn, this guy's fucking serious. Like, you serious, dude? All right, I need to find a thousand. All right, my bad, you know what I mean? Well, sometimes we get out the studio at like 4.30 in the morning and we drive to the house. I would try to go crash and he'd wake me up and here, driving me to Calabasas. We go from Norwalk to Calabasas to, to Palmdale to wherever we had to row because he had so much on his mind. Eric was a, a, a machine, dog. It's amazing, dog. He's the only dude that he call you six. And like he's rolling, like he's up rolling. Like you just might have left him at the studio at 3:30 in the morning. He's calling you at 6:30. What's up, man? You ain't up yet, man. We shit, meet me in Hollywood. And, and like, hey, man, dude. He used to stay up. He would rarely get sleep, dog. He only sleep like three, four hours a day. Up, like, damn, this nigga's amazing, dog. This dude is incredible, dog. He just did everything everything if we did a photo shoot and i remember all this vividly he was there he was in the pictures he was like telling us where to shoot we you know it was crazy we ride with him in his low rider i mean these are just things that you can never forget so that day he tells me i know you and tony think that i fuck with y'all a lot but i don't do this for me man i do this for my kids and i was like oh oh okay he goes yeah man you know man one day i want to leave my label to my kids man it ain't for me donations to different organizations. More laid back than people really would know. You see him with the glasses and the little hat. You know, that's one way. And when it's not business, he's, he, he was a person behind his kids. I mean, he loved. It, it was a lot of kids, but he loved every one of them. He had like like seven, eight, something like that. But we were racing at the, the, together to have kids. I got fired. I said, I retired, man. I quit at six. I can't do it no more. He was still rolling, you know. Loved his kids and and uh, and uh, treated all of them the same way. Good, real good. And tried to do the best that he could to provide properly for them. They were coloring with some books that he had bought her at the Disney store with the colors and everything, man. And so he was sitting there coloring and he was talking to my little daughter and, and she was telling him, easy, let me use the brown. And so he's like, no, 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 you need to put the purple on that right there. And then, see, I'm going to put this yellow. You need to do that purple. And, and so she goes, oh, okay. Well, give me that one. And, and so they were coloring. I sat there, and I just looked at him, and I was like, damn, man, this is a really nice dude, man. That's what made me feel, because it was really personal because of my daughter. And I seen how they were interacting without them knowing I was there. He would do things like he would have rodeos and, you know, clown shows and, 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 and lunches and picnics and all that kind of stuff just for the inner city kids. And, you know, try to give back to the hood and, and, and just give give a little bit back to society because he was given, you know, so much through this gangster rap that he put out, you know. I remember, yeah, I remember going with Easy to Juvenile Hall in Norwalk, and I remember him going in there. And I remember when he came out, he told me, man, man, I feel bad for them kids, man. They need some TVs. They need to have a few things, man. And he went out and got some things for them. And then uh, every Christmas, Jewish, black, white, Gentile, whatever you is. It's the things that you don't hear about that are meaningful. It's the things that are in the in the in the background that those things he did from his heart. 
And he didn't do them for the publicity or to be recognized by anybody. He did it because God in, touched his heart and allowed him to be able to be financially secure to do those things. I wasn't always sure where he got his money or how he got his money. Um, but I did know that the money that he had, he put into making music. He put into making records, he put into his own art, he also put into the other people that were important to him. I do all these little benefits, but a lot of people don't know that. He really did a lot of stuff, more things that people don't know. Charities, this, you know, all kind of little stuff. But the person, he's a little devil. <laughs> he was just like me and you. There was really no way to feel. Either you was a super groupie or you was a super fan, and it was just it. It was just he was down to earth. It was just like, okay, we're going to do the show. He didn't have his own separate tour bus. He took us on tour. Didn't nobody know who we was, but when we left them cities, they knew. You know, he rode on the tour bus with us. If we had to get car service, he was in the car with us. If we in the backstage chilling on the back, he didn't have his own separate room where this says Easy e and others here. He was with everybody. A guy that was distant or because I'm huge now, you know, or because I have money now, you know, I don't need to talk to the smaller guys. He always talked to everybody, at least to me, the same way, you know, same level. Eric all, never wanted to make you feel less than him. Like he always tried to bring you up to him. There's a difference in and people, like sometimes there's people that want to make you feel less than them. Like, I'm, he, I'm me and you're here. Eric always wanted to like, you up here with me, man. Let's roll. That's what I loved about him. Like he didn't let you get down. And... I can remember the first time that NWA uh, came to play in Dallas. It was at this venue called City Lights, which was an old movie theater. I went to the show and I was literally the only white person in the building. And I was, I'd gone by myself. I couldn't get anybody to go with me. And I was like, kind of standing in the corner in my little track suit, you know, trying to stay out of the way, you know, or whatever. And, and they came rolling in, this huge posse of people, you know, Dre and Eric and Cube and all these people. And uh, Eric looked over and he saw me like standing in the corner and he's like, Jeff, what are you doing? Get over here, man, come on with us. And I was like, all these other big dudes behind him were all like, who is that? You know, why does Eric know him? You know, what the fuck's up with that? And then I would never forget one time, because we didn't have no cars, and um, we needed a ride. And Silky Fine, she stayed like about two miles up from me. And he drove and picked us up. And when he pulled up, he had this white Cherokee Jeep. He pulled up on my mama's block, and kids was just coming from everywhere. And he was like, that's easy. So I had to get in the car, because he had to hurry up and take off. And the kids was just running down the street after the car. And I was just like, wow, Easy e came to pick me up. <laughs> If you, were his, if you were his homeboy or you his buddy, he was just like your brother, like do anything for you, you know? I mean, I was in awe, because here's a person who I've admired since I was a little kid. Yeah. Now I'm sitting right here with him. So I was kind of like, kind of starstruck, I guess. Yeah. Just watching him, you know, just tripping off of him. This from the camp, really, of the whole NWA, you know what I'm saying, as far as being, you know, being really cool with you on some real, like you seemed like you could talk to him and he was real cool. He wasn't on no Hollywood shit, you know what I'm saying? He was like, he was a real cat, you know? He didn't have no, he didn't seem like he had an ego, even though he had all, you know, all the cheese. That's one thing about Eric, that uh, when he would see me, he, he would always come up to me, you know? And, and to me, I saw myself like down here and him up here, because his shit was already blown up. And I'm thinking, I would see him at a club and I'm thinking, oh, I'm not even gonna go up to him because it's been a couple of months and maybe he just made new friends or something, you know? Tony A, and I would turn around, and I was like, hey, what's up? And I was like, oh, what's up, man? You still remember me? Yeah, man, what's up, man? You still doing those mixtapes? Let me know when you do another one, man. I want to throw it down. And I was like, oh, shit, you, for real? You still want to? If he's doing, having a party, he's not in VIP. He's walking around through the party. So, I mean, he's a very hands-on, personable person. So it wasn't a person that you couldn't reach or couldn't get to. You'd see him at IHOP. You'd see him at drive through at Taco Bell. You'd see him at the Sizzlers get, making a salad. Like, you see him in the bed. You see him on a, a, a ride at Six Flags. <laughs> I mean, every day, if we wasn't recording music, we was just hanging out like homies. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you probably did with your friends growing up. We were just kicking it. We was always getting high. It was always girls around. And we were just hanging out. Like, we was having fun. The song was selling. 
You know what I'm saying? We, the video was number one for a long time. We was always on tour. You know what I mean? So okay. we was having a good time. He was never down. He, everybody, we was just chilling. We ain't had no controversy or nothing. You know what I'm saying? We was just having fun. That's when I, I started to learn about him. Like, he, he at that point was, like, burned out with material things. Like, I could just tell. He was, he didn't give a fuck. He got, like he said, he liked, the Jeep, he liked the Jeep Cherokee more than any of his cars that he had. Like, he, he would rather stay at our house in El Monte than have us go to his mansion. He'd rather be in the hood in El Monte in a little garage just hanging out. Like, that was more his vibe. Like, like he was just like that. I don't know. He was. He had a big heart for such a small person. That's what I've always said about him. He just cared about some things people wouldn't think that he even gave two shits about. You'll listen to his music and just think he's just this gang-banging dude from Compton, dope dealing on the block, but that wasn't hardly the case. He is the one that knew being from a suppressed environment, being a statistic, being profiled, being being going through the system all the time, that you can actually be that versity. You know what I mean? And that's what made him so beautiful. He loved to see other people do their thing too. And if he could be responsible for it, I think that's where he was getting his reward. You know, like that's what made him happy, like breaking acts and putting them out there. For me, he was the first person to put me on an airplane. I've never been out of the state. I don't know, all around the world now. But we fly, I'm in my first flight with him. I'm sitting on a plane. I've never been on a plane in my life. And it was the worst flight I ever had. I've never had a flight worse than that. Turbulence, over Grand Canyon, how the plane drops. I'm sitting there, I'm holding my seat. And I remember other people on the plane were like, look at the bodyguard. So you can kick his ass. Now he ain't gonna do nothing. I'm holding the seat. You're right, kill him. He was really funny. He had a fucking amazing sense of humor. He was like, he was like a practical joker. You know, he would always call and leave these messages on my answering machine that were really funny. Like with me, we went to a chiropractor. I'm just going with him. You know, I'm riding with him. I go. We sit. He goes in. The guy comes out, little Asian guy. He comes out. He says, "Okay, my friend, you're next." So no, man, I'm just with my friend. No, he paid for you. All right. When I go into the room, he's already in the room sitting there. I said, what do you want? He said, okay, I can't watch. I said, watch what? He said, I just want to watch. I pay for it. I can't watch. Okay. So I laid down. Dude told me to lay. And dude cracked me from neck to tailbone. One rap. And I said, ah, I jumped. And he got up laughed. That's all I wanted to see. And he walked out. But he knew. I, you know, he, he paid for me to see me jump. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to roll up 20 joints. If you can smoke half of them, then... Something, 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 something. He was like trying to make a bet with me. So we sat in the hallway, got to like seven joints. I was so high, I was like, I can't do it. So that was like my initial, you know what I mean? Like that's how we kind of bonded. And ever since then, it was just all good. The uh, studio was in Torrance. And uh, when I walked in, he was like, oh, we just laid down a track. We want you to come. I, you know, I, wanted, I wanted you to check it out. You know, let's go out to your car. And so we went out to my car, put the cassette tape in, and the song, I think it was Gangsta Gangsta, and it just started playing really loud. He just jacked up the volume and <laughs> it completely blew my speaker. I got a check for 90000 for you. He take off. But when you get to the bank, get to the teller window, it says Mickey Mouse on the check. So now you're like, you're feeling real idiot at the bank. Now you got to go catch it. Now he's not answering the phone for two days. One day we went to the Carson Mall and bought just about every gun in the Carson Mall. I'm talking about back when they used to sell, like, you could buy semi-auto rifles back then, like HK, the ones that look like, you know, from A-Team or whatever, you know, you could buy those kind. You see this chamber right there? It's no bullshit. This is real. This is real good. Nine millimeters in your ass. Nine. <laughs> he knew how to shoot. He had guns, 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 whole lot of guns. Motherfuckers that come out of the studio with guns and shit and all kind of shit and easy E. Come on, oh man, y'all y'all selling Glocks off the box? Oh man, let me get three of them. Like, damn, y'all got a lot of shit coming on through the studio. And we were on a tour bus one time, going, doing a show. We stopped off at a, um, what was it? It was a, not a carnival, but um, one of those county fairs. And it was us on the bus, iced tea, like a bunch of groups on that bus. And they happened to have a gun show <laughs> at, the, at the fair. Bought like 15, 20 guns. And we're on this bus, like, 
And if we get pulled over by the police, I think we had fireworks too. Because it was somewhere like Texas or someplace like that where you could buy illegal fireworks. And we had like half sticks of dynamite and guns. And if we had got pulled over on that bus, that would have been it for everybody. <laughs> you gotta carry these or you get fucked up on the street. So you gotta be and prepared. And this got an infrared scope on it. You put the dot on your target, then you blow this shit out the motherfucker. No joke. Women. He was a, I would say, I would say a woman, woman's man or a woman's choice, but he was, women was his life. Mutual friend of his and mine is like, hey, I want you to meet this guy who wants to meet you. And, and I'm like, I know him, I've met him before. So from there, the rest was history. He kept calling, we went out on a date. I realized, oh, he's actually normal. That was his, you know, that was his girlfriend. He was crazy about it. I met her at his, at his birthday party. He had, his, he had his 21st birthday party about three times. He was always 21. I said, dude, you'll get no older around here. But I met her there, physically met her. He introduced her to me as, this is special. Like, this is the one. He started perking up around after Bone hit, you know. Then he had did the the Dre 187 record, you know, which was the Compton City G's, you know that that was that was cool, you know. So he was coming back, and that's why the, the, the sick it just it 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 it, 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 it just don't make sense to me. You know, we're fine, we're having fun, we're doing what we're doing, and every year around November, December. He get bronchitis. This is like clockwork, dude. I mean, he's coughing every year. This is just what happens to him. But you know, he was like normal. You know, a little coughing. But he, to me, he looked normal. But I looked at a couple of pictures from back then. He did look a little smaller. And I remember being around him. He had a cold off and on for about a, at least a, about a year. And uh, sometimes I would, I would think, okay, that's the bronchitis. But other times I would be like, hmm, you know. He was coughing, you know what I mean? He was, I could tell he was coughing. He's like, yeah, man, I was in New York, man, and, and they left me at this club, man, and, and I had I just walked through the snow. That was the day that he seen Ice Cube out there. So when he got sick, he went to New York, and I didn't go, but I was at the studio when he came back. He was sick as a dog, dude. I mean, sick. They had the little asthma inhaler, and I'm like, man, what's wrong with you? He was like, I'm sick, man. I'm like, Man, you know, like coughing, just coughing, coughing, like, dude, take some coughing, you know, like, I'm, I'm not being, sen you know, I couldn't be sensitive to something I didn't know about, so I'm giving him the riot act, like, dude, you're coughing on everybody, really, you know, and I can't remember, i never forget that day, I came in the back, by the bathroom, he was laying on the carpet, I'm like, what are you doing, I just don't cough when I lay down, that's what he said, when I sit up, I start coughing. Like, that ain't natural, bro, you know. And he started carrying an um, a oxygen tank with a little mask. And I was like, this is kind of serious. A week before he went in the hospital, we was talking and he was coughing. <laughs> I was like, man, you, I was teasing you. What's wrong? You got that shit? I was just teasing. All we kept hearing was Easy's in the hospital, Easy's in the hospital, Easy's in the hospital. Then I was hearing it on the radio. Then it was on the news. And then we're like, what is going on? We weren't around the studio a lot, so I actually heard about it on the news. So then I started making the phone calls. What is going on? You know, guys, what's happening? What's And they're like, we don't know anything. We just know that he went in there because Eric has always had asthma. So he would have that inhaler on the road. And so we knew he would you know, take a puff of his inhaler and he would get bronchitis a lot. So I just figured maybe it's just the bronchitis because they said he went to the hospital for bronchi bronchitis and that's when they found out. And I'm just like, what? And at this time, I had already started to hear the AIDS rumor and people were saying I was already almost having fist fights with motherfuckers over disrespecting that. Like, I heard your homeboy got AIDS and people were really fucked up. You know what I mean? Like, what the fuck you, man? Don't fucking talk about my homeboy like that, man. I'll fuck you up, man. Word was out that he was in the hospital. 
So we got get well cards and had all of our friends and homies from the block where he started. We love you. You know, the way it's set up, I said, we get up the elevator, we look at the nurses, we see his room number, because we didn't know what room he was in. And uh, we seen his name, Eric White, Eric Wright, room 5105. I'm like, wow, it's crazy. He's in room 5105. And he had an album called 5150. And the numbers were. So I opened the curtains and I said, man, damn, that's some sunshine. But you know what I mean? Like, you sitting here like you dying, right? And he just sat there. Then Tamika walked in, you know. Like, she came and said, I have to talk to you guys. I'm like, what? She told us he had AIDS. He had on an oxygen mask. I remember he looked at me and he said, did she tell you? I said, I said yeah. And she said, he said, she told you everything? I was like, yeah. When I found out about Easy being sick, Buddy of mine, Big Man, finally told me. See, Big Man had been going to the hospital, but without telling me, because Eric didn't want him to tell me. I get a call, I called up to Ruthless Records, and, and his secretary told me, you know, if you need to talk to Easy or you need to, you need, or he owes you any money or anything like that, you better go to Cedar Sinai right now because he's about to die. That's what she told me on the phone. It's kind of fucked up, too. Yeah, it was kind of fucked up. Like, what? Three hours of it hitting the airways, Trey was standing in the lobby at the hospital trying to find Eric. And he actually got to see him, you know what I mean, before he died, so that was that was cool. By the time I really found out he was in the hospital, they had already did some kind of surgery. So I never actually got to talk to him no more. And when I seen him in the hospital, it was maybe a couple of days before he died. You know, he was in, you know, I guess they had put him in like a paralyzed thing before he wouldn't pull the tube and stuff like that. So I didn't actually get to talk to him. I, I, I sat there and talked to him at the bed, but I don't know if he heard me. He had the, the big tube in his throat and his chest was going to it was breathing for him. The doctor said, we're going to put him on his machine just so his lungs can rest. So he's not strong enough to take it. So when I went in to see him, you know, he's in there, his chest is pumping. His eyes is closed. And I stood next to him on the bed. I looked down. I didn't say nothing at first. And I said, I said, dang, man, just like that. Just quiet. You know, you speak out loud to yourself sometimes. I said, dang, man. And he grabbed me. He grabbed my hand. And his eyes just opened like that. He looked me right in the eye and he was just looking at me. And I said, dude, now, I've, we've been through some stuff. That's the first time I ever saw him scared. Fear in his eyes, right? And I said, dude, don't trip, don't trip. And I said, dude, and the machine, like, duh, 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 making noise. And the nurse came, she looked, she said, no, he's cool, he's okay. I said, all right. So I sat there with him, and I said, this tube is only for a couple of days, you hear me? And he, he shook his head, he, he could still, like, yeah, yeah, I know. I said, okay, he's like, yeah. All right, and he was holding my hand so tight. And I took my ring, and I said, look, I'm going to give you this ring. You know I like this. He said, you give this back to me personally. He said, yeah. So I, that was the last time I saw him. Easy is concerned. You know, they, his mom's still stay around the corner. You know, they still interact and still mess with the sisters and the kids and stuff like that. So, so uh, it was kind of like a, it was kind of like a big blow when that happened because it, it, it messed up a lot of opportunities. The example he gives us is safe sex. You know, it's not that he died in vain. He's one of us. So he died and made you see it real. I mean, I know when Easy E died. Madheads was like, yo, that's a little too close for me. You know, you hear about this one and that one, but that's easy E. And if it can happen to him, it can happen to me. Let me get my life together. Let me get it straightened out. Eric's spirit is right here. Us talking about it is right here, man. And it's like he's in, he's in purgatory and not wherever he at. Wherever you at, he's I love you. You know what I'm saying? You've been with your friends so long and and you ain't really, really pulled to the side and told the motherfucker thank you, and like, like, you know what I mean? Like a genuine, real, we were so busy, I never really got to tell the guy, hey man, thank you man for all the beautiful shit you've done for me and on us, you know what I mean? All I wanna do is just thank him.
niggas with an attitude, man, ain't shit new, you know what it do, he brought out Dr. Dre, Ice Cube, MC Ren, and DJ Yeller, the West Coast, my nigga was Trump tight, he was the only nigga with an M16 in the studio, spitting 16s, you know what I mean, gangsta shit, 5150, home for the sick, easy does it, eternal E, nigga and song, straight off the streets of motherfucking Compton, he love his act this block, this man off top, out for the cash crop, screaming, fuck the police, a new voice in the streets, express himself, sample from a legend, Charles Wright, and the Watts, 103rd Street, rhythm band, damn, homeboy is real, the life of a legend, all documented, non-fiction, the boys in the hood brought life to the hood, the godfather of the first West Coast movement, got the planet moving, West Coast, that's how we moving, Easy e found of the movement, everybody tune in your station, gangsta music spreading through the nation, West Coast, that's how we moving, Easy e found of the movement, everybody tune in your station, gangsta music spreading through the nation, no radio, no television, even no publicity, and still sold 3 million records, G, straight out of Compton, NWA, Easy made it easy, pioneer, bone thugs, history, a good man in harmony, loved his family, Focus with persistence on the West Coast mission. Business connecting at the rodeo. Now we're selling out the stadiums from ghetto to ghetto. At a hood near yours, the gangster, gangster, get a rap star into the corporate world of innovative rap music. West Coast, that's how we moving. Easy E, founder of the movement. Everybody tune in your station. Gangster music spreading through the nation. West Coast, that's how we moving. Easy E, founder of the movement. Everybody tune in your station, gangsta music spreading through the nation.